So thanks to everyone that uh, had a chance to take a look at Mr. Bates. He's sitting in the back. He wanted to listen into the conversation. So I appreciate anybody's input from what they saw and their, their thoughts on the exam. Uh, his initial exam is about a year and a half ago. He presented to me with, uh, we say acute vision loss, but relatively subacute vision loss with a sub sublux uh, in the bag, single piece acrylic torque intraocular lens. Uh, he had some slit lap findings suggestive of pseudoexfoliation. Pseudo uh, his gonioscopy shows just a very mild San Paolesi line. Uh, the exam also demonstrated basement membrane dystrophy in both eyes. Uh, he had normal intraocular pressures at that point. Uh, and his optic nerve exam showed some mild cup to disc asymmetry, but there wasn't any uh, notching or thinning thought to be present at that point. But obviously the, the emphasis or focus of the exam was on the assessment of the subluxated lens and uh, surgical preparation and planning uh, for repositioning of that lens. So surgery was performed. It was a scleral fixated uh, via a technique that's been popularized by Gary Condon. Uh, those of you who use this technique know that the, the needle point on that is ne not necessarily ideal for this technique. Ideally, it would be just sharp at the tip and then smooth along the edges. There is a little bit of a tapered component to the needle that's currently used with this. And, and a little bit of cheese wiring of the inferior pass of the suture, not enough uh, to necessarily abort the technique, but it uh, resulted in a modest decentration of the intraocular lens. It's very well fixated. It doesn't move. There's no denesis or other abnormalities uh, with that, but that did result in some mild decentration of the lens. It was very stable. It was uncorrected vision. Even with a toric lens, we were able to get that reasonably well uh, positioned relative to the original targets, and so his uncorrected vision is 2030 with uh, manifest refraction of uh, spherical equivalent uh, less than a half diopter and his astigmatism is consistently less than a half diopter on uh, manifest refraction. His IOP continued to be normal through this uh, process, but uh, despite this recentration of the intraocular lens, he still felt like the vision quality in the left eye was never as good as the right eye. Uh, and so it was somewhat of a conundrum for me trying to figure out, well, what, what is the issue here? Is it, is it this modestly decentered lens? Is this really causing this type of visual complaint? Could it be the basement membrane dystrophy causing some of these issues? Uh, so we did a soft contact lens over refraction, which improved his vision to 2020. Uh, at this point, we decided let's, let's do some medical therapy for the ocular surface and see if, if we improve that ocular surface, maybe that'll help improve the visual complaints. Uh, and then down the road, we could certainly consider uh, you know, secondary surgical intervention for either the basement membrane dystrophy or the decentered intraocular lens. In the, uh, in the meantime, so we did that uh, medical therapy. To this point, it really hasn't made any difference. Uh, in the meantime, started to notice an elevation in his uh, intraocular pressure, and that triggered a, uh, a decision uh, to perform a glaucoma workup. Um, in that, we'll go through the testing uh, and uh, why I think the glaucoma may be a significant issue in terms of his visual complaints. But uh, he still feels very strongly that that intraocular lens issue is a significant component of his visual complaints. Uh, he felt like the vision was fairly normal or essentially normal before the lens decentered. Uh, and so this, one of the reasons we're here is to listen into the discussion, get uh, some input from other individuals uh, uh, to allow for that discussion to be helpful in terms of yeah, your opinion and assessment of the cause of his visual complaints. So I'll show you just a few th things here. So we've got his topography. You can see there's some irregularity of the anterior surface. This is the OPD3 for those who aren't familiar with it. The axial topography there in the top center. Uh, you can see just, uh, again, a little bit of uh, inferior steepening and some irregularity related to the ABMD. Uh, this is present in both eyes and probably has a similar impact on vision uh, in both eyes based on topographic analysis in his uh, soft content lens refraction. So this uh, is the uh, original RNFL uh, that was performed uh, when his pressure was spiking up. You can see he's got significant thinning inferiorly uh, in that left eye. The right eye, fortunately, looks pretty good. Uh, it's hard to appreciate when you look at the nerves. But he's got small nerves with a lot of uh, nerve tilt and inferior parapapillary atrophy, which makes it a little bit more challenging to assess the nerve uh, on exam. This is his 24-2, which was formed just a few months ago. You can see the left eye, again, a significant superior field loss. Um, sort of a variant arcuate, uh, dense arcuate change there, hemi-field change. 
and this is a 10-2 uh, showing very central, uh, the central impact of that uh, visual field cut uh, that's present in that left eye. We've got him started on uh, latanoprost, which has lowered his pressure from the mid to high 20s down to the uh, mid-teens, uh, 16 or 17. Uh, the, the question uh, and the discussion here is, you know, what impact do you think, uh, with regard to his visual complaints, uh, what impact or contribution are we getting from the basement membrane dystrophy from any of the eye wall decentration versus that glaucoma field cut? And based on that assessment, would you recommend anything treatment-wise for the basement membrane dystrophy or surgery for the IOL? Or do we believe the glaucoma field cut is the primary cause of the, of the vision complaint and focus specifically on treatment for that and minimizing the risk of progression or further loss of visual function? Uh, based on the testing, my uh, working uh, diagnosis is the glaucoma field cut is a cause for the vision change, but I don't want to necessarily uh, take that without listening into some of your thoughts. So uh, does anybody have any comments uh, for those who were able to see, see the patient and assess him? Go ahead. Uh, Jeff and then Susan. Well, one thing I did notice is he does have a, an APD um, on the left. Um, the small nerves are, you know, you start out with a small nerve, you don't have much tissue there. Any amount of cupping is significant, I think, especially oh, yeah. if you look at both, compare the nerves. Um, I think there is a lot more cupping there on the left. And then, um, you know, glaucoma is notoriously difficult for patients to to describe the symptoms of, and, and he, he will tell you that himself. It's just, he wishes that he could, that we could see what he could see. It's like looking through wax paper, Venetian line, kind of a thing, and um, so all of that together makes me also uh, agree kind of with your assessment that I think the, the glaucoma probably is a large part of what he's, he's noticing. I appreciate that. It's, that is something that he's certainly uh, and, and I've heard that multiple times. You, when you try and get him to describe it, it's, it's, he says it's difficult to describe it. I wish you could look through it to see what it is that I'm seeing uh, to better appreciate it. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. And, you know, we, we know that in eyes that don't get good signal from glaucoma, that optics, at least optical ab abnormalities, aberrations, they have a greater effect. I mean, there's a reason why glaucoma is a contraindication for multifocals. People do horribly when they don't get that crisp, clear image on, in one focal point uh, right on the retina. And, and so, you know, certainly I, I think glaucoma is the, the main issue here, uh, but anything that could be done to correct optics could potentially help. Um, no, not messing, I wouldn't mess with the IOL. I mean, that, that's, that's, in my mind, a, a, almost a home run as far as, you know, getting that Tericity, um, at least in, in an axis that is helpful. The ABMD is interesting. I mean, you know, I, I mentioned upstairs, perhaps you know, letting him walk around with a contact lens for a couple weeks to see if that that might make a difference for him. If he's functionally noticing a change, then I'd consider some sort of uh, ABMD treatment. But short of short of an improvement with the you know contact lens um, trial, I, I wouldn't do anything with the optics. Yeah. Well, I think that this really illustrates the um, effect that pseudotiliation has on the zymus for his dislocation of the IOL well within the capsule bag <coughs> in the first place. And we've done lots of studies in our laboratory showing how pseudotiliation is the most common cause for this spontaneous dislocation. But interestingly, we had a whole bunch of specimens that Liliana and I received from Germany where they were sent from you know a very reputable place with the chairman people who are very german and, and really do good examinations and they were finding they found exfoliation in a third of the patients and when we actually did the pathology of the specimens we found that two-thirds of them had exfoliation so even in the hands of a really good observer you can still miss exfoliation so whenever you see spontaneous dislocation within a capsule bag you really got to think exfoliation first of all but the second thing is, in this case, with the toric lens, I'm really impressed that, you, that you've got the results that you've got. Because with those toric lenses, when you're trying to suture them in position, even if they're off 10 degrees, 20 degrees, you can lose a lot of the, the effect of the toricity, plus they tilt a little. 
and no matter how you suture them, they're still going to tilt. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't touch that lens because um, chances are not only not matching this result, but are making things worse by trying to reposition the lens that's in there. So I would leave it alone and treat the glaucoma and, and attempt to treat the basal membrane disease. Okay. I like that contact lens with the 2020 vision. I'd follow through with that. That is one more thing to do, but get use daily lens, put it in the days you want it. And don't worry about it the other days. Okay. That's a simple approach and yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Okay. And that's the same point, just stressing the, I guess the gray hair crowd here is that contact lens is really, <laughs> and uh, it doesn't make a big difference. Okay. And if the soft doesn't do it, a heart just really that new that surface from the heart provides, they oh, yeah. just to sharpen right up, they say, I love this, even though it's a hassle to put a heart contact, they will they do that for that visual quality. So I think really that's your easiest, less aggressive approach to do is try to contact lens rather than first. Bill, with the ABMD, it seemed like it wasn't really that central. Like it's pretty peripheral changes. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, and the challenge with doing like a superficial keratectomy is the refractive shift that you're going to get, and you, you don't really know how much sill you're going to induce and aberrations. I mean, you assume it's going to be better, but he could shift a couple diopters in his refraction and then his uncorrected vision will drop. So yeah, it can take six to twelve months for yeah, it to hard to know stabilize which way to go with that. Yeah, it's not a, not an ideal option. Certainly, I'm not rushed into that. Any other thoughts? I appreciate your input, and uh, Mr. Bates also appreciates uh, your input and ability to, to hear that conversation. So, thank you.